We all know that not all killers are apprehended right away. Sometimes one has to wait for forensic advances to get very far, despite any suspicions one may have. And then there are times when a person becomes overly confident because they have gotten away with murder. Such is the case with Robin Lero, who left a sloppy trail of death and ashes. Robin Lee Cornelia was born on September 12, 1957, in Nashua, New Hampshire, to parents Virginia and Charles Cornelia. They were 16 and 17 when they had Robin, and she was the eldest of five children. The family was very poor growing up, and her father, Charles, seemed to have difficulty keeping a steady job. He was known to have alcoholic binges. However, Robin maintained that she was very close with her father and she claimed that her mother was cold and distant. But that just could be because she had to work all the time to keep the family afloat. There were violent arguments at home and allegations of a grandfather sexually abusing Robin and at least one of her sisters. In her early teens, Robin's parents divorced and she rarely saw her father after the split. By 14, Robin got pregnant and her mother took her for an abortion. But just two years later, at 16, she got pregnant again. This time, she kept her pregnancy a secret. And in 1974, she gave birth to a son named Keith Cornelia. A year later, in October 1975, Robin gave birth to another baby, a girl named Christina May. Robin met a boy named Wayne Hamilton and they started to date. Wayne was a part of a little gang of young men who earned cash by committing petty crimes and also setting fire to cars. In 1976, one of the guys from the gang implicated both Robin and Wayne in a car burning scheme called Arson for Hire. Wayne was given a choice to serve time in jail or join the military. He ended up enlisting in the Marines and he left the area. Robin was not arrested. Shortly after Wayne left in 1977, a fire mysteriously broke out in the apartment complex where Robin lived. She was forced to move out and there's not many details about it, but we know that Robin and her children had to move back in with her mother. On January the 31st, 1977, Robin's daughter Christina was found dead in Robin's bed. She was just 15 months old and Robin claimed that she left Christina sleeping and went downstairs for milk. When she returned, her toddler was cold and not breathing. Her death was attributed to SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Now at that time, SIDS had only been an accepted term of cause of death for about 9 years. So it wasn't until much later that researchers understood just how extremely rare it is for a child older than 12 months to die of SIDS. A few months after Christina's death, Robin's boyfriend, Wayne, was transferred to a camp in North Carolina. The two got engaged and Robin moved out with her three-year-old son, Keith. In March of 1977, she married Wayne and the little family moved into a mobile home off base. It was in this mobile home that Robin experienced her second residential fire. According to Wayne, a few weeks after their wedding, he was asleep in their bed. When a loud sound startled him, he woke up just to find flames shooting up from their dresser. He was able to put the fire out, but he noticed that Robin wasn't in their bed. He found her sleeping on their couch, and he later said that she had never done that before. The fire was not reported to authorities. Not long after that fire, Robin was arrested for writing bad checks. She was convicted of forgery and she was given a four-year sentence in North Carolina State Penitentiary. By March of 1978, she was out on parole, but Wayne was not interested in staying married 
and so Robin moved back to New Hampshire with her son Keith. Back in New Hampshire, Robin rented a small apartment and her sister Terry, who had a young daughter, lived nearby. She and Robin traded watching each other's kids and because of that, Robin had a key to Terry's apartment. One night when Keith was five years old and staying with his aunt Terry, a fire broke out. Terry was awoken by the sound of her daughter and Keith screaming and she found her apartment engulfed in flames. Somehow, she and both the children managed to escape unharmed. This fire was devastating and the fire department had difficulty identifying what caused the fire. Eventually, they ruled it as accidental and possibly electrical. At one point, Terry discussed the fire with Robin and she made the comment to the effect of, this is why you should have life insurance on your kids. In early 1980, Robin and her then six-year-old son, Keith, moved to California. She had a friend who owned a little cabin in a place called Somerville. It was a remote place and it mainly consisted of cabins, a store and a little dive bar. The friend offered Robin and her son Keith to live rent-free while Robin worked to establish herself. The cabin was a little two-bedroom wood structure with very few amenities. Now on the night of June 19th, 1980, Robin claimed that she was woken up by her cat jumping on her face and she found that her cabin was on fire. She barely escaped. She ran to a neighboring home and she banged on the door for help. The neighbor, heroically, ran to the burning cabin and tried to find little Keith. Robin told him that Keith was trapped in the bathroom. The neighbor broke into the bathroom from the outside but he could not find Keith. Eventually, Robin told him that actually he was in his bedroom. The man went to the front of the cabin and found that the door was padlocked from the inside. Unfortunately, he had to retreat due to the thick smoke and heat. It was only until the fire had been put out that Keith's little six-year-old body was found on the floor of his room, badly burned. Fire investigators found a portable electric heater in Keith's room with a pile of clothes pushed up against it. They noticed that the heater had its switch on the on position and even though Somerville, California was experiencing a 90 degree Fahrenheit day and very warm nights, so this was a bit odd, eventually the fire was ruled accidental. Now, with the likely cause of being the heater igniting the clothing pile. Robin claimed that she was in the hospital for several weeks um, due to smoke inhalation, though there is no public record to verify this. What is public record is that she received $28,000 of insurance money from a policy that she had taken out on Keith's life. Now, remember, this was in 1980. So, if you account for inflation, that is the equivalent of having a little over $88,000 of life insurance on a six-year-old. Now, many people, including the local sheriff in Pine Creek, were very suspicious of Robin, but the fire was ruled accidental, so no one could be charged for the death of little Keith. After she received the proceeds of the life insurance policy, she bought a mobile home and a new car. Apparently, a series of strange fires broke out around the mobile home park where she lived, but nothing was ruled criminal or resulted in people being hurt. At some point, she moved into an apartment in Pine Creek where she got pregnant and in December of 1981, she gave birth to a son named Joshua. Around the same time, she reported that her car was stolen and it was found totally burned out. Robin collected the insurance payment for the loss of her car. In 1982, she was arrested again for financial crimes. This time, it was for embezzling from her employer and she pleaded guilty to grand theft and she was sentenced to the California State Prison for three years. 
Some friends in the area took care of Joshua while Robin was in prison. After nine months, she was released on probation. She stayed in the Pine Creek area and got, you guessed it, pregnant. This time with a daughter who she named Tabitha. There was ongoing disputes about paternity of both Joshua and Tabitha, but Robin did collect child support from a few different men. And though she eventually left California, and the men were no longer involved in their lives. Okay, now at this point in Robin Cornelia's life, she has been involved either directly or indirectly with four residential fires and a handful of automobile fires. In most of these cases, she stood to benefit. She also had two children die while in her care, and she has been in prison twice. Let's just say that she is extremely unlucky. In summer of 1987, Robin decided to leave Northern California. She did so in an unreliable car, very little money, and her two kids in tow. Her car broke down in Reno, and she had to get them all bus tickets. Her bus took her as far as Boise, Idaho. She was close to penniless at this point, and she ended up finding a shelter and eventually the Young Women's Christian Association. Now, with their help, she was able to get herself and her kids a place to live. Eventually, she worked herself up within the YWCA and she rose to the ranks of managing one of their locations. In March of 1988, Robin met 31-year-old Randy Rowe. Two and a half months after meeting, they were married. Robin, Tabitha and Joshua moved in with Randy and ultimately ended up renting a duplex together. During the time that Robin worked at the YWCA, an interesting event occurred. In the early morning, one day in the fall of 1989, a fire broke out in the basement of the YWCA. Fortunately, no one was hurt and investigators concluded that it was clearly an arson fire. They found a pile of clothing that seemed to be out of place and a small electrical heater that was switched on. Although both things were out of place, it was determined that they were not the cause of the fire. It actually originated in the corner of the room where it was likely ignited with an accelerant. Robin was not suspected of anything at the time, but she did collect a small amount of insurance compensation for Christmas presents that she claimed she had stored in the basement, which got destroyed in the fire. Now, in the same year of 1989, Randy had a very bad motorcycle accident. He ended up with serious disabilities and he was completely unable to work. This left Robin as the family breadwinner and Randy stayed at home and took on the responsibility of caring for the children. In February of 1991, Robin was promoted again to manager of YWCA's bingo operation. When this operation launched, it was pretty successful, but just a year later, in February of 1992, it was starting to lose money, and Robin was told that they'd be shutting down the bingo center and doing an audit of the financial records. Shortly after Robin heard this news, there was a disaster at the row house. In the early morning hours of Monday, February the 10th, 1992, a fire raged in their duplex. Robin wasn't home that morning. She had spent a night at her friend's house after a fight with Randy. Robin claimed at 3 a.m. she had a premonition of the fire. She woke up her friend and at 5.30 a.m. they drove together to the duplex to check on Robin's children. Local fire trucks were already on the scene and after the fire was sufficiently under control, fire crews entered and found the bodies of Randy and her two children Joshua and Tabitha, who were aged 10 and 8. Sadly, all three of them died from carbon monoxide poisoning as a result of the fire. Fire investigators found that the fire primarily was started in the apartment where it joined the garage and a second fire started in one or more piles of clothing 
that were in the living room, where there was also a space heater. There was an accelerant used, the smoke alarms were disabled by someone flipping off the circuit switch that was tied to them. The victims weren't alerted to the fire because of this, which caused their deaths. Furthermore, the furnace fan was set to turn running continuously. This was strange because Boise averaged a low night temperature. It's interesting to note that someone who is familiar with fires might know that leaving a fan running would speed up circulation of the deadly fumes throughout the residence. Boise is in Ada County, so the Ada County Sheriff's Office was the primary investigative agency. Chief Investigator Gary Rainey was assigned to the case. Now Roe was his primary suspect. He did some digging into Robin's past and he knew he was on the right path. During his investigation, he discovered that Robin was in possession of a certain amount of cash from the bingo games. She had brought it home because it was the weekend and she was supposed to deposit it on Monday the 10th of February. When she was asked about this after the fire, Robin claimed the cash was destroyed when the duplex burned down. Due to her history and the loss of more than one child in a suspicious fire, Sheriff Rainey was able to get search warrants for the remains of the duplex, Robin's car, her friend's residence, and also the storage facility that Robin had rented. During these searches, police discovered six insurance policies carried out by Roe on the lives of her now dead husband and two children. The most recent policy was taken out 17 days before the fire and it totaled to $276,500. When they searched the storage facility, the investigators found that it only had Robin's clothing and newer looking furniture and some of Robin's memorabilia. It also held fragile possessions that clearly belonged to Robin and it had been wrapped in newspaper dated February the 7th, 1992, just three days before the fire. Investigators also found the missing cash and bingo cards from the YWCA. Nothing of Randy's or the children's was found there. Despite all of this, there was literally no direct evidence. There was no fingerprints, no DNA, no proof that she had purchased an accelerant. Could they show that she had singe marks on her skin? No. And it seemed that she had an alibi. She was at her friend Joan McHugh's all night long on Sunday the February 9th. Or was she? Law enforcement officials didn't have enough to arrest Robin for arson and murder. But they realized they did have enough evidence to arrest and charge her with grand theft. For the stolen YWCA money and other financial crimes against her employer. On February the 13th, 1992, three days after the fire, she was booked into the Ada County Jail. While in jail, Robin made frequent calls with her friend and alibi witness, Joan McHugh. Investigator Rainey questioned Joan, but she was firmly on Robin's side. She was told about the large amount of life insurance policies and also the fact that the last policy was taken out just 17 days before the fire. So she agreed to use a device to record her next conversation with Robin from jail. Joan, on the direction of the investigator, lied to Robin and told her that she woke up early and she didn't see Robin on the couch. And Robin, if she was innocent, she would refute the statement. However, when confronted with Joan's lie, Robin hesitated and she told Joan that she could not remember where she was. By March 20th, 1992, the deputy prosecuting attorney signed a criminal complaint to charge Robin with three counts of aggravated arson and a judge issued a warrant for her arrest. When she learned about being charged with felony murder, Robin called Joan and told her that she had remembered where she had been during the early hours of that morning when the fire started. She said that she was actually outside of Joan's house and she was talking to her psychiatrist. When Joan pressed Robin for the name of the psychiatrist, Robin refused to tell her anything more. At this point, Joan realized that her friend was likely a cold-blooded murderer. Robin Lee Rowe's trial was held from late January to early March of 1993. Her defense tried their best 
to throw suspicion at Randy, the prosecution had a large number of witnesses who contradicted most of the claims of the defense. The jury returned a guilty verdict on all counts. Robin's sentencing hearing began on October the 19th, 1993. The state was seeking the death penalty. At the conclusion of the hearing, the trial court found that four statutory aggravating circumstances had been proven by the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. After an admission in court, Robin on the 16th of December 1993 was sentenced to death and given 20 years for the aggravated arson. Judge Alan Schwartzman called her a pathological liar and said the premeditated murders were the final betrayal of motherhood and a descent into the blackened heart of darkness. No adjectives exist to adequately describe this heinous crime. It's a shocking atrocity. Robin was definitely a pathological liar and greedy. To condemn all her children to an awful and torturous death is pure evil. Her husband Randy did not deserve the ending he got. We can only take comfort in knowing that they are all resting peacefully.